you do what only you can do, and that is to change hearts and to change minds in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning we wrap up our series on biblical worldviews, or developing a biblical worldview, and not only developing it, but maintaining it, and we're going to see this morning even the importance of passing that on. We have looked at seven different questions, and if we can just throw that graphic up there, I'll allow you to look at that. If this is your first time here, I'll just remind you, or tell you, I guess, for the first time that you can go back and you can watch the series of lessons on developing and maintaining a biblical worldview where we hit on each of these questions. Uh, with a, everybody has a worldview. A worldview is the lens through which you see everything. And in a biblical worldview, the center or the focus is supposed to be, from a biblical worldview, God. However, as you look at just the way most people live their lives, most people live their lives as the center being them and their family. Whatever is closest to them, that is what is really the focus. That is the center. And as God's word informs our hearts and our minds, we realize that we make him the center. Then believe it or not, everything else works out from there. Uh, when we're looking at the guide or the lens, that's the Bible, obviously, from a biblical worldview. And from a secular worldview, culture, which is ever-shifting and ever-changing, which makes it hard to have any sort of a solid foundation, uh, is, is going to be a challenge for you. The purpose in life, why do we live? Well, for most people in a secular worldview, well, I just want to be happy. You'll even hear sometimes parents say that to their children. I just want you to be happy. And parents, if you've ever said that to your children, uh, don't beat yourselves up over it. Most parents do say those sorts of things. Just know that it's not the right thing to say, okay? Uh, your children, if they seek happiness throughout their lives, they're going to be this, in this endless, fruitless uh, cycle of pursuing something that is not a constant. How many of you have been happy every moment of your life? No, it's... It's like this thing that, almost a mystical pursuit, like I just want to be happy. And you think, okay, well, if I just get this, then I will be happy. And then you get that, and you're happy for a little bit, and then you want something else, and that will make you happy. And it, it's like this temporary pursuit that causes a lot of people to actually fall into depression because through their lives, they aren't able to attain what they think is their greatest purpose, that being happiness. Whenever we can see from a biblical point of view or a biblical worldview that the point of your life, the purpose of your life is not your own happiness, it is the glory of God. To bring God glory, then even through trials, you can bring God glory. Uh, even through uh, difficult circumstances, you can bring God glory, and certainly in those happy times of life, you can bring God glory as well. Well, we went through four other questions as well, which I'm not going to go into all of those this morning, but again, you can go back and you can look at those, and I know that I saw some of you with your phones out just kind of snapping a picture of that, and we may throw that up later as well. If you, if you want this graphic, I can send it to you also. But this morning, we're going to wrap our series up. And uh, we're going to look this morning at kind of trying to establish a couple of things. Number one, how do we pass on a biblical worldview to the next generation? That is an important thing for us to try to figure out, right? And then the second thing is this, how many areas of life does this biblical worldview touch? Now you can probably figure out already that the biblical worldview touches every area of life. You can probably figure that out, but we're going to hit some specifics here in just a little bit. Uh, first week of this series, which would have been, I think, seven weeks ago, I shared just a bunch of statistics with you. Uh, many of you probably remember that Sunday where I shared a lot of statistics about our youth and the generations and how many, how many of this, what percentage of this generation, the older generation, 
believe in biblical authority and just have a general worldview that's uh, affected by the Bible. I want to share a statistic with you this morning. In a 2021 interview with the Family Research Council, George Barna, who if you know anything about George Barna, he is a statistics guy. He uh, puts out surveys and does a lot of research. George Barna stated this. He said that a person's worldview begins to develop at about 15 months and is almost fully developed by 13 years of age. I want you to process that for a moment. And I'm not, that's not the gospel truth. Like George Barna doesn't get to decide this is absolute truth. God's word defines absolute truth. But he does a lot of research, and I trust a lot of the research that he does. And, it, and he says, listen, it starts to develop at 15 months and is almost fully developed by 13 years of age. In our teens, in our 20s, he says we tend to refine it, apply it, and articulate it. Now here's the sobering thing. About 82% of professing Christians who believe that they have a biblical worldview actually don't. 82% of Christians, professing Christians, believe that they have a biblical worldview, but they don't actually, according to his research, possess a biblical worldview. So let that sink in. If we were to take 10 people, we're going to segment 10 people out and just make groups of 10 all throughout our congregation. His research would suggest that 8 out of 10 of you don't actually possess a biblical worldview. Now, right about now, everybody's like, I'm part of the two. Form a group, I will be the two, I will know who the other eight are because, like, yeah. But so often, we believe things about ourselves that aren't actually very accurate. Sometimes we have a higher view of ourselves than what is actually true. And one of the ways that you can know whether or not you have a biblical worldview is think of the area you don't want the Bible to touch. Think of the area of your belief system or your practice that you don't want the Bible to touch. If you can come up with that area, which most of us have those areas, then you aren't possessing to a strong degree a biblical worldview because you're saying, and this goes back to Romans 1 that we talked about a few weeks ago, you're saying, I would prefer to suppress what the Bible says about this area because that's going to cut me to the core. I'm okay with what it says to everyone in these areas, but just leave this alone. So if you have those areas, then chances are pretty good you actually have developed your own worldview, which is a mixture or a combination of a biblical worldview and a secular worldview. So for the last six weeks, we've looked at a comparison of worldviews. We've answered some key questions which, if answered honestly, give us a good look into whether our worldview is secular or whether it's biblical. This morning, as we wrap up, we want to look at the importance of not only building, but also uh, building into the next generation this biblical worldview. And before I get into that, I can imagine that some of you maybe heard that statistic earlier, or heard what George Barna said earlier, that by the age of 13, your biblical or your worldview is largely developed. And some of you might say, well, then what do we do if currently we're over the age of 13, which I'm looking around, and to a large degree, most of you in here are over the age of 13. What do we do if our biblical worldview is, or our worldview is already established and it's not a biblical world? What do we do? Well, hopefully right away you can think that, okay, we are given the Holy Spirit uh, we are given the admonition in Romans chapter number 12, and we have looked at those verses before, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. How do we renew our minds? We load our minds up with the Word of God. If you're struggling with a biblical worldview, the first thing you need to do, and we had this lesson a number of weeks back, you need to solidify in your own life whether or not you do trust in the authority of the Word of God. If you trust in the authority of the Word of God, then what you need to do is you need to get this Word, His Word, into your heart and into your mind. How do you do that? 
you are committed to the, 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 the spiritual disciplines, go back to the beginning of the year that we were trying to teach through and say, okay, you have to have, have some time. It's not about saying, I did this, check mark. Okay, today I read the Bible. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but if that's your goal, check mark, I read the Bible, that's a bad goal. Check mark, God's word got into my heart today. All right. Check mark, God's word is transforming my mind today. Amen. Check mark, I was allowing his word to change my attitude, change my way of thinking, change my way of behavior. That is remarkable. So every time we go into God's word, we don't go into God's word just to say, hey, I read it. We go into God's word to say, okay, I read it so that it could transform my life. All right, this idea of building into the next generation a biblical worldview. How do we go about doing that? I think there are very few parents, very few churches, very few Christians who intentionally fail to instill biblical worldviews and biblical principles into the next generation. So if nobody is intentionally saying, we don't want them to get it, how is it happening that every generation seems to have less and less commitment to God's word and to a biblical worldview? How does that happen? Every situation and every family is obviously different. But let's look at a few principles that I think will apply to all. To be honest, they're simple principles, but they're principles which require intentionality. If you will, look with me to Joshua chapter number 1. Joshua chapter number 1. The Lord had led the children of Israel out of Egypt. They were in captivity there, yet they doubted him and his provision all along the way. They had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses has just died, and the Lord is ready to lead them into the promised land. But notice what the Lord says to Joshua, and these are not unfamiliar verses. They are verses that I know we have referenced before, but they need to be brought to our attention again. Verse number six of Joshua chapter number one, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law that my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not, now notice this, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Notice again verse 8, and I kind of pause there to allow you to at least realize the importance of what is highlighted there. We need to make sure that for the next generation, that we actually for ourselves make God's word a part of our lives and a part of our, the life of our family. Do not, verse 8, let this book of the law Depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. It's got to be a part of your life if you want it to be a part of the next generation's lives. Parents, it's got to be a part of your life if you really expect it to be a part of your children's lives. If God's word doesn't affect you throughout the week, if your children don't see God's word changing your way of speaking, if they don't see it changing your attitude, if they don't see it changing your behavior, then why would they then naturally just want it, right? But when we meditate on it day and night, when it affects the way that we interact with our co-workers, when it affects the way we interact with other members of the family, when our children see that it affects the way that we interact with the cashier at the grocery store, when they see that it affects the way that we drive. We've talked about driving like three weeks in a row now. I'm not quite sure why that is. When they see that we don't just say, okay, it doesn't get to speak to that area, then what they see is they see authenticity. They see a genuineness about our faith instead of seeing what? 
hypocrisy. And our children are, are great hypocrisy detectors. But when they see it affecting us because we meditate on it day and night, it's going to make a difference. It has to make a difference in the lives of us as individuals. It has to make a difference in the lives of our families and honestly, in the life of our church. I was watching just a portion of a, a message uh, about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks ago. And within about the first seven minutes of that message, I was like, I'm done. I'm turning it off. And you want to know why I turned it off? Because there was no Bible. And that might not bother some of you, but it bothers me. Like, and I was so impressed. Actually, Kylie Young is one who, whenever she went out to Missouri to college, started looking at different churches she could go to. She reported back one time... She, I think it was a church that I actually recommended. I felt bad about it. Uh, I said, hey, why don't you check this church out? Well, she went there, and the pastor didn't use a Bible. And she's like, you know, he said some good things, but, like, he never used the Bible. I'm like, well, I'm glad that your radar detector just kind of, I'm glad that your senses went up and said, that's just not right. Like, we have to use God's word. We need to be meditating on his word all the time. You read something in the morning. Don't just let it stop there. Let that ruminate in your mind. Meditate, same word, ruminate. Just roll over and over and over again in your mind all day long. When we studied through bringing glory to God, I mentioned last week how that's just affected so much of every portion of my day. Because that is just something that the Lord is bringing to my mind all the time. Is this bringing glory to God? Is this bringing glory to God? So if we're going to pass it on to the next generation, it has to be genuine in us. At the beginning of the year, when we went through a study of the spiritual disciplines, we highlighted the importance of the word of God. But the reality is that many individuals and many families, many Christians have bought into the false notion that the Bible is outdated. The Bible is irrelevant. The Bible needs to be apologized for. And the reality is just the opposite. Look into Psalm 119. If you want to read about just the Word of God and the high priority of the Word of God, Psalm 119 is just filled with so much good stuff about the Word of God. I'm just going to read a few verses from it. Verses 12 through 16. Listen to this and follow along if you have your Bibles. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I re recount all the laws that came from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and I consider your ways. I delight in your decrees and I will not neglect your word. Wow, what a beautiful portion of scripture. Can you imagine saying this? I rejoice in following your statutes. In other words, what you say, God, I rejoice in that as much as one rejoices in great riches. I am so thankful, God, that you are teaching me. In fact, I'm so thankful that I would rather soak up what you're teaching than get my paycheck. Ah, Pastor Dave, you're going a little far right there. I rejoice in following your statutes, he says, as one rejoices in great riches. The first reality is this. To a large degree, God's word, instead of being in the driver's seat in our lives and in the lives of our families, in the life of our church, has been relegated to a back seat. And sometimes not even the back seat. It's kind of like you're in the you're in the caboose of a train you are in the trunk of the car like okay god's word like we'll hear it every once in a while but it doesn't get the driver's seat we need to allow god's word to be the driver of our lives so a change has to be made and this is principle number one we must elevate god's word to its proper place as the authority in our lives, the life of our family, and in the life of our church. A few years ago, whenever Meredith uh, started taking over the, the kids' wing, uh, we reviewed our curriculum for back there. And I don't know how many of you have looked at children's curriculum over the course of the last five to ten years, but what you'll find in a lot of children's curriculum is this. 
There are a lot of interesting videos. There are a lot of um, neat little things, but there is very little of the Word of God in much of the children's curriculum that is out there these days. And we didn't want that to be the case here at Northwinds Church. It is important that we do our part. Now, obviously, as parents and as grandparents, you have a part, the largest part, in the training of your children. But our part here at Northwinds is to make sure that in our children's wing, in our youth group, uh, in everything that we do, in our life groups, in our ladies' ministries, we elevate high the Word of God. That has to be the case. And so that's principle number one. We elevate the Word of God to its proper place as the authority in our lives, the life of our families, and the life of our church. The second thing we need to do is also found in the book of Joshua. So go ahead, you're probably in the book of Psalms. Go ahead and turn back to Joshua. We were in chapter 1. Let's go to Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter number 4. We're going to read a number of verses here. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9 and then skip down to verses 19 through 24. Follow along if you will. When the whole nation, again Joshua 4, 1, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan. So remember back in chapter 1, Moses has died. God has said, okay Joshua, you're going to lead them in. Well in the process between chapter 1 and chapter 4, uh, they are getting ready to cross the Jordan River. When the whole nation had finished crossing it in chapter 4, verse 1, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe. Tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe. And he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, that be twelve, to serve as a sign among you. And notice this, in the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Then tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp, where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan, at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. Go down to verse 19. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan, camped at Gilgal on the eastern border, border of Jericho, and Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones that they had taken out of the Jordan. And he said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this, why? So that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Did you notice the number of times that it said, in the future, your descendants, they will then be able to look and to ask and to see why and to ask, why are these stones here? Well, the Lord your God did this. The Lord your God did this. And I'm not suggesting that you set up some sort of a stone memorial in front of your house. I am, however, suggesting that parents... And leaders, if you want to pass down your faith in a biblical worldview to the next generation, you need to lift high the work of God. You need to lift high the work of God in the life of, of you as an individual, in the life of your family. How many of your children know about your testimony of when you came to faith in Jesus Christ? How many of your children have you sat down with and said, here is what we went through, mom and dad went through. We went through a tough time in life. And quite honestly, there were times when we doubted the plan of God. And, and yet we saw how he brought us through. 
And, and everybody's story is a little bit different, but you do have a story of faith if you are a child of God. And you can look back at these memorial moments almost, and you can lift high the work of God in your life. And whenever you do that and your children see it, why is it that we go to church every Sunday morning? If your kids ever ask you that, I pray that your answer is not because that's what we're supposed to do. Yes, it is important to gather together as a family of believers. Yes, it is important and it is what we are supposed to do. But the reason we gather, the reason that for all of my life, my parents took me to church and then whenever I graduated high school and I had a choice as to whether I was going to go to church, the reason I kept going to church and the reason that I continue to bring my family to church and to instill in them biblical values is because of who God is. He is the creator of the universe. He is the sustainer of all things. He, we have nothing without him. I have no strength without him. I have no ability without him. Everything that I have is because of him. And the moment you start thinking that anything that you have is as a result of how good you are, how athletic you are, how creative you are, how intelligent you, go, you are, just know this, all of those things can be gone in an instant would the Lord not see fit to sustain them in your life. And you say, how do you know that, Pastor Dave? Well, I tell you what, I've seen a lot of really good athletes in our community blow out a knee and all of a sudden their athleticism doesn't amount to what it used to amount to. I have seen those who have gotten concussion and they have lost their childhood memories and, and, and they don't have what they used to have. I have seen those who put a lot of weight in their jobs and they lose their jobs and then all of a sudden, and so if you don't understand and if you're not teaching your children that even through those difficult times that it was God who sustained you, if they don't know the testimony of the work of God in your life then why would you expect them to have a genuine faith it's important to lift high the word of God and the work of God in your life don't be afraid you don't have to tell your children and you, you pick the appropriate time you don't have to tell them every failure you've ever made in life and how God has redeemed you from that and how God used even tragedies and, and, and God used these, these mistakes and, and, and made you into the person. You, you don't have to tell them every detail, but certainly lift high the work of God. My children, uh, they know of the tough times that we have gone through in life. They know of the good times that we have gone through in life. And in every one of those times, we have sought to point back to not how we feel about what's going on, but rather an acknowledgement that God is working whether we see it clearly or not. I just encourage you, if you want to pass down your faith to the next generation, a biblical worldview to the next generation, then you need to lift high the work of the Lord in your life. Deuteronomy chapter 6, often a passage that has gone to for baby or children dedication Sundays. Deuteronomy chapter number 6, I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. We read this, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. This is Moses speaking to the people, so that you your children, and their children. So here we see the descendants, right? We see the next generation. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord the God of your fathers promised you, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. If you'll remember, that is uh, a, whenever Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Uh, he reflected back to this, and then he said, the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 6, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. If you'll remember, whenever Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, 
What did he say time and time again? I care about what's in your heart, not just what you're doing. I care about what's in your heart, not just what you're doing again and again and again because the Pharisees had become about this religious performance type thing. You know, let's make everybody, let's, let's, let's make ourselves look good. But all the way back, the Lord had said, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them, here we go with the next generation again, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Notice what it says in verse number 7. Talk about them when you sit at home. It's easy to talk sports. I love talking sports. Talk sports to a lot of people. It's easy to talk about weather. It's easy to talk about tenured families. Uh, it's easy to talk about how the day at school went. It's easy to talk about a lot of things. How often in our conversations are we talking about what God has done? Are we lifting high the work of God? Talk about them when you walk along the road. Talk about them when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, let his work and his word be a part of every part of your life. And then it says, verse 8, which might seem a little bit confusing. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Uh, They call them phylacteries. Uh, They would have little pouches that they would literally tie on their wrists and tie around almost like a headband. Uh, and they would put little portions of scripture into those, those pouches. In fact, in Matthew 23, verse 5, uh, you can look there at some point. Remember, whenever Jesus is talking about the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, he says, you make wide your phylacteries. Uh, like they made big ones so that everybody knew, like, okay, I have it on there. What is trying to be taught is that the word of God needs to be a part of your everyday life. They would tie them on their wrists. Uh, some of you, uh, in fact, if you have one of these, uh, some of you wear like wristbands for a certain cause or for a certain reason. How many of you have one of those on? Just lift them up right now. I know some of you do. Come on. Some of you have them on and you're not lifting. Okay, I see a few of you. Thank you. I know, I, I see them when I shake your hands, okay, guys? Like I, I know that, thank you. Uh, I know that some of you, you wear those, like, and it could be a different cause. It could be, um, I know some of them are actually ones that we gave out a couple of years ago, uh, or last year, 2021, that were better together, uh, because it was a time during COVID where it seemed like everybody was having to be a part, and we just wanted to be reminded of what the scripture taught about being together and worshiping the Lord, and we're better together, and so people do that still today is basically what I'm saying. They, they put reminders on them. Some of you have little post-it notes on your mirrors. Uh, some of you put things on refrigerators. Some of you have a Google Calendar. In fact, I would have missed a meeting this week if it wasn't for Google Calendar. Okay, so like there are different things that are reminders. This was about reminders of the word of God. So tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your forehead. It says, write them on the door frames of your houses. That is, uh, the term there is actually a mezuzah. And I might not be saying that exactly right, but it was a shoulder height on the right side of the doorpost. They would also, they would put a little pouch there and they would typically have in there uh, Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So that every time you walked in the door at shoulder height, which is basically eye level, you would be reminded that this house belongs to the Lord. This house belongs to the Lord. Some of you have... Uh, in your house is a, a thing that says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you want to pass on your faith to the next generation, if you want the next generation to have a biblical worldview, we need to lift high the word of God, and we need to lift high the work of God. The word of the Lord and the works of the Lord should always be before us. If not, we will find ourselves, and I believe we have found ourselves, in the same situation as what we find in Judges chapter number 2. Go ahead and turn over there, and you're saying, Pastor Dave, you're using a lot of passages from the Old Testament. You're right, because all of God's Word fits perfectly together, and uh, we see a lot of instruction about the next generation throughout the Old Testament. We also see some of the warnings about how the next generation has not followed the ways of the Lord, and we're going to see that in Judges chapter number 2. Judges 2, starting in verse number 6, says this, after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land. 
each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua. Make sure you're paying attention, attention to this. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things that the Lord had done for Israel. So now you might be able to remember back to whenever... Um, Whenever, all the way back when the children of Israel originally went into captivity in Egypt. Remember, Joseph had gone down there, the plan of the Lord. There was going to be these seven years of famine. It says, eventually, uh, a pharaoh, a king, rose up who didn't remember Joseph and his descendants, right? So now we have this entire generation has died off that saw and was physically a part of crossing the Jordan River. And notice what happened. It says that Joshua, the son of Nun, verse 8, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Harris in the hill country of Ephraim north of Mount Gash. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, in other words, they had died, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. Those are false gods. They forsook the Lord, verse 12, the God of their fathers who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. Verses 7 through 9 said, okay, the people served the Lord through the life of Joshua, the life of the elders, those who had physically witnessed what had taken place. And then verse 10 starts with these two words in the NIV. After that. After that. And I know you can't absolutely control the after that. Once your life is over, I, I know that we don't have absolute control over that but i think sometimes we too quickly dismiss the role that we have in the after that nearly everyone here is aware that a few years ago uh, i had a heart attack and it just changed my perspective of life i did not feel like the lord should have allowed me to live i did not feel as if i deserved another day on the earth like i i felt beyond grateful and still feel beyond grateful that the lord has allowed me more days every day i'm just thankful uh, i'm thankful to get to watch my kids grow up i'm thankful for so many things but it really got me like ultra honed in on what about when i'm gone and i care so much and I hope you care so much about who your family is when you're gone uh, my grandma Purdy so special in my life went to be with the Lord when I was still pretty young but she had done a tremendous job of raising her children to be passionate followers of the Lord and I'm so thankful that my dad was one of her sons, and I'm thankful that my dad and my mom, they cared about my faith and the faith of my brother. And I'm so thankful that my Uncle Jack and my Aunt Karen and Aunt Lois and Aunt Alice, I'm thankful that they cared about and care about the faith of their families. And as I thought my life was coming to an end, all I could think about was what's left when I'm gone. It's the after that. After, after you're gone, what's the legacy of faith that is left in your family? And again, I know you can't perfectly control that. But if you elevate high and lift high the word of God... And the work of God in your life. If you are transparent 
because we're not trying to do some sort of religious performance. I'm not trying to make it, I'm not, I hope you don't misunderstand this. When we're elevating the word of God and the work of God, it is not like elevating ourselves to this Christian arrogancy, which should not exist. We've studied that so many times. What we're doing is we're saying we lift high who God is and look at how he has worked in our lives. And I want, I want more than anything, and I believe this is the desire of your hearts as well, the same, I want more than anything for my kids to forever and ever and ever follow the Lord. To honor him with all of their lives. To go through difficult times and say, okay, okay, God, I don't know exactly what you're doing, but I trust who you are. I trust who you are. Lift high the work of God and the word of God in your life. So we need to do the endless work of instilling into this next generation a biblical worldview. We don't want a single generation to grow up who, as it says here, knew neither the Lord nor what he had done. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the next generation growing up knowing neither the work of God or what he had done? Like, don't let that be true of him in your family. Psalm 78, verses 1 through 4. Go ahead and turn there just real quick. Psalm chapter number 78, talking about passing it on to the next generation, says this. O my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden, utter hidden things, things from of old. What we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. Verse 4. We will not hide from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of our Lord. We'll tell the next generation. Don't, don't spend all your life talking about things that in the end don't matter. Make sure you're talking about the most important things. And that are the things of the Lord. There are so many more passages that I'd like to look at. And even different areas I want to go into. But... I'm going to try to wrap up. The first question for today is how do we pass it on to the next generation? First of all, it's got to be true in your life, right? If the Bible isn't touching every area of your life, your kids know it and they see it. If the Bible isn't touching every area of the life of our church, you'll know it and you'll see it. You better call us out on it too, right? Right? Because here at Northwinds, we want to lift high the authority of God's word in every area of our lives, every area of our ministry. It matters. So it has to be true in your life. And then the two principles that, that we taught very clearly, lift high the word of God and lift high the work of God. You have a natural transition to talk this afternoon over lunch about what God has done in your life and in the life of your family. Some of your kids don't even know what your life was like before Christ. All they know is, well, I mean, they don't remember much from one to four, probably. They kind of remember age five, five on or whatever, and so they kind of know who you are. But maybe they need to hear about how God rescued you. Maybe they need to hear about how God brought you through a dark time in life. Maybe they need to hear about the the times in your life when you doubted the plan of God, you doubted the work of God. Maybe they need to hear about how, as a result of you going through that, you now have a stronger faith. Lift high the work of God. The second question that I wanted to hit this morning, which I'm just going to ever so briefly touch on, is, well, what areas of life should a biblical worldview touch? Right? And 2 Timothy chapter 4 says that there's going to come a time, and I'm just going to read these verses for you real quick. 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, and I'll make this the last passage for this morning. Paul, writing to his son in the faith, uh, Timothy, says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. I cannot emphasize this enough. Some of you have a 
really difficult time communicating with someone who is not of a like mind as you. They don't think the same way as you do. They don't act the same way as you do. And you have a hard time being able to communicate with them in a way that doesn't come across as pushy, offensive, rude. Uh, there's a lot of other words we could probably throw in there. But we need to understand that in addition to speaking the truth in love, which we are instructed to do, we are told here, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come, and this is a time in which we are living, when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Believe it or not, you can go to churches all across this country, and they will tell you that there is no such thing as sin, there is no such thing as biblical morality, there is no such thing as sanctity of life. There is no such thing as, and you can just kind of fill in the blank. You can find a church to tell you what you want to hear. You should never look for a church that tells you what you want to hear. It's just the truth. You should always look for a church that will tell you what the Bible says. Because quite frankly, what you want to hear this week or what our culture wants to hear this week is different next week and different the week after that. But it is the unchanging word of God that needs to be the driver in our lives. So people will try to find these teachers to tell them what they want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. The Bible speaks clearly on matters of family. The Bible speaks clearly on matters of marriage being designed by God to be between a man and a woman. We see this all the way back in Genesis chapter number 2. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The Bible speaks to the creation of two genders. The Bible speaks to morality, what is moral and what is immoral, what is right and what is wrong. The Bible speaks to the sanctity of human life. The Bible speaks to forgiveness that is available to all. The Bible speaks to how we interact with a society that largely is opposed to him. And notice this, Romans 12, 18 tells us this, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So this bullying nature, this arrogant nature of Christianity should not exist. The two greatest commandments we mentioned earlier, love God and love people. Even love our enemies, those who have chosen us as their enemies, not we choose others as enemies because we learned, and this is just where everything in God's word ties together. We learned a long time ago out of Romans and actually out of 2 Corinthians as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, we don't look at anybody through a worldly lens anymore. We look at them through the love of Christ. If you've been saved by the grace of God, then, and we will continue to highlight this, you don't view people with the same lens you once did. We view all people as in need of the same grace that we received at the cross of Calvary. We've got to view people that way. So if someone doesn't hold to a biblical worldview, we don't belittle them. We don't mock them. We don't make up catchy memes about them. We pray for them and we seek the opportunities to be able to have meaningful conversations. I've talked to a number of you about this. I believe it's important to figure out who is it that you are called to have an influence on. I don't believe it is my calling to try to influence everybody on Facebook. I just don't think it's my calling. But if you become a part of this family, then it is my calling to make sure that in my interactions with you that I'm honest about what God's word says. There's a right time and a wrong time to have conversations about various aspects of our belief system. And again, those catchy memes that you think, oh, that got them right there. No, actually, that did more harm than it did any good. It made you feel good about yourself because there was something that said what you were thinking. Jesus, whenever he interacted with the woman at the well, can you imagine the memes that would have been created in advance for him to be able to get her to realize just how wrong her lifestyle was? 
Yet Jesus didn't use a catchy meme and he didn't use a catchy phrase. No, he had a genuine heart that longed for her to see she needed the living water. She needed him. And Christian, if you can begin to grasp the concept that if we want to pass along to the next generation, and if we want to see others come to know Jesus as their Savior, then it's got to be a genuine love for them, regardless of where they are in life, because God so loved the world. And then you can go to Romans, and you can see that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Like, there was nothing good about us. So, let's bring it all to a close this morning. We're going to pray. Elevate high the word of God and the work of God. Elevate high, we just talked about it, the love of God for people. And let him do the work in their lives. If you have direct influence in someone's life, then yeah, have those meaningful conversations. But always speak the truth in love and do it with gentleness and respect. And you know what? The perception of Christianity and Christians might just be a little different if we would do that. If you are a catchy memes person, think about that for a moment. Let God work in your life the same that he seeks to work in all of our lives. Lord, thanks for this day. Thanks for the opportunity to look into your word. And we probably didn't, I know we didn't, exhaust all the ways in which we could look and we could see that your word should affect every aspect of our morality, every aspect of our interactions with people, every aspect of, I just pray, I want to pray two specific things, Lord. I want to ask that you place a burden on every adult here this morning who is a child of God, one of your children. Place a burden upon their heart to pass on to the next generation the faith that they have. To elevate high the word and the work of God and the love of God. And then, Lord, I also want to pray that in our interactions with those who don't know you, those who think differently, those who act differently, those who talk differently, those who maybe are completely opposed to everything that we do, I pray, God, that you would help our hearts to be the same as your heart. That being so much love, so much compassion, so much grace, that people would actually be drawn to you rather than pushed away from you. I believe that you can do that in our hearts. I believe that you can do that in our community. I pray that you'd help it to start with me and to start with us. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a pretty simple challenge this morning. Uh, certainly.